Hi, I'm Asha Keddie, and I played the role of Ita Buttrose in the ABC miniseries Paper Giants. It's been 50 years since Ita first arrived on the scene with the launch of the groundbreaking Clio magazine, at the time giving a voice to women and showing what working mothers like herself could achieve. Now as the chair of the ABC, Ita Buttrose is still trailblazing, and like so many of her roles, it hasn't been without controversy. With the ABC celebrating its 90th anniversary, we update her story as she speaks candidly about her tenure and the career that made her a household name. This is the Australian of the Year Awards 2019. Please welcome to the stage the Honourable Scott Morrison. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Appreciate it. I was at the Australian of the Year Awards in Canberra with my son and my daughter-in-law. The awards had been given out and we're having a drink and a nibble and a bloke comes through the gloom and he says, are you Ida Butteros? And I said, yes. And he said, the Prime Minister wants to see you. I said, right. He leads me to a room and the PM's in there with other people and they're all told to leave. And I'm thinking, what the hell have I done? He didn't beat around the bush. He just said, look, I'd, I'd like to offer you the chair of the ABC. and. I'm just thinking, really? Uh, and I did say to him, Prime Minister, you've taken my breath away. Well, there's no need to answer right now, he said. Get back to me in a couple of days. I'll give you my mobile. What's yours? I thought, ah, I see what my whole career has been about. It's been leading me to this job because I, I thought everything I've ever done in my career has equipped me to be the chair of the ABC. So. I went outside and I, and I joined, rejoined my son and my daughter-in-law and I just said to them, lean in. I'm pleased to announce that Ms Ida Butros be appointed the next chair of the ABC. Ida is really unique in the Australian media landscape. She was with Clio magazine, the Australian Women's Weekly and commercial television. We saw her on morning chat shows. She became a respected and, and loved central figure in, in, in the Australian popular culture, if you like. She's one of these figures where the, the word, the overused word iconic is actually very much justified. I trust Ida. And that's why I've asked her to take on this role. And I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that she's accepted. I'm passionate about the ABC. We are Australia's leading cultural institution. And I do believe I have the distinction of being the only chair of the ABC who has ever had any media experience. My most important role is to restore stability to the management of the organisation, to reassure the staff that it's time to get the ABC functioning again. One thing I do remember when I walked in the doors at Ultimo at that time, I could sense a sense of gloom. There was gloom. I just thought, oh, this place is in a spot of bother. It doesn't feel right. When Ita came into the ABC, it was at its lowest ebb, where at the end of 2018, the ABC had lost its managing director in highly controversial circumstances, and it had then a few days later lost its chairman in even more controversial circumstances, and it was all around uh, the uh, suggestion that the ABC's independence had been compromised. So she starts in the role as the captain's pick of a prime minister at a time when perceived politicisation and political pressure on the ABC was at its height. I think there was a, a perception that, despite all her experience, Ita was simply there really as the crowning act of a very successful media career. Step up, step up. But relatively soon after her appointment, the ABC was under attack and Ita was on the other side pushing back. Tonight, the ABC's Sydney headquarters raided by the federal police. Officers seized thousands of items relating to news reports from 2017. The AFP raid was all about the ABC's coverage of alleged war crimes by Australian troops in Afghanistan. Uh, he would be uh, special forces. The execution of search warrants by AFP personnel caused considerable angst. There was quite a bit of public policy work 
kicked off in response to the concerns that were expressed by journalists. Now, there will always be differing uh, perspectives. I was shocked. I mean, what sort of a country are we where we send the federal police in to, uh, to threaten, to frighten, to intimidate the national broadcaster? Ms Fatro says she'll fight any attempt to muzzle the national broadcaster. I know how important the freedom of the press is and I will defend it to the utmost. Anyone who might have thought that uh, she was uh, easily dictated to, um, easy to push around, I think was going to be in for a rude shock. Tonight we come together as the ABC marks its 90th anniversary. This year's Ollie lecturer is Ita Buttrose, ACOBE. Like Andrew, a giant of our profession. I knew I wanted to be a journalist when I was 11 years old. My favourite book at the time was A Journalist's Life for Me. I still can't think of any other career I would have wanted. My father was a journalist, editor and author who travelled the world. The ABC is the United's blood. Not many people know that Ita's father, Charles Buttrose, joined the ABC in 1957 and worked his way up to being assistant general manager by 1974. I went to ABC concerts with my father, remembering that the ABC used to control the orchestra. For some concerts, they have five rehearsals, and that then 140 concerts a year, it's a very hard-working orchestra, and to get away on a trip like this has done them the world of good. I was always very influenced by my father. He really was my hero. I thought everything he did was just ace. Tell us about her childhood, won't you? Well, she was, Ida as a child was pretty much like Ida as a woman. Amiable, uh, very easy child to bring up. Well-disciplined, ambitious, competitive. I used to discuss the stories in the papers with Dad. I would often make him breakfast and we'd look at the newspapers and we'd talk about stories. She had three brothers to cope with and she coped with them very well. The boys made me fiercely competitive, I think. I, I, I learned to stand up for what I believe in. But no, you guys played football and cricket and we had swim races. We weren't going to have a mamby-pamby girl in the family. We wanted a girl that was a woman that stood up but, you know, could handle it with the boys. You were never last picked in the, in the teams because you guys were ferocious. Would you Whatever like the boys did, you know, I did. I didn't think there was anything boys could do that I couldn't do. I left school at 15 because I wanted to be a journalist, because I wanted to start. I was so keen. I got my first job as a copy girl on the Australian Women's Weekly, and that's really about as low as you can begin. My big break came with a tour to Australia of the Queen's cousin, Princess Alexandra, when I was 17. And Dad said, if you can get a glimpse of what somebody else is writing, take a glimpse. There might be something you can knock off. We didn't have Media Watch to keep us on our toes back then. At 23, I became women's editor of the Daily and Sunday Telegraph's women's pages. Some of the staff weren't very happy, some of the staff quit, they thought I was too young. But you've got to let people know you have ambition, you've got to put your hand up. See, I've always put my hand up. Sir Frank Packer established the media empire in 1933 with the Women's Weekly magazine. At 19, Kerry Packer finished school and went to work for the family's publishing business. Kerry Packer and his father before him always gave women opportunity. Uh, there were many women in management positions. It was an exciting time. When I married, I married at 21. Dad, he and my mother and, and probably me thought that I'd give up work because women still did that when I started work. It's just everything changed. And I got married and I had the children, but I kept working. And people would say, and who's minding your daughter today in that way as though you're a bad mother? They would want a bad mother. <whistles> Mum was always there for us. So even though she worked very long hours and um, was not at home looking after us all full time, but she always said if we ever need anything or anything was a worry or anything like that, we could just call her, and we did. I'm really thrilled to have the job of editing Cleo because I'm confident there are lots of women who want to be treated like intelligent human beings, capable of making their own judgments. They wanted sex. 
they wanted fashion, they wanted feminism, and they got it in a controversial magazine called Clio. Yeah, I was just 30 years old. It was a, it was a fantastic opportunity and a, and a very big challenge. I can't give you any guarantees that it's going to be magnificent, but if money, time, effort and a good staff mean anything, then this magazine's going to be a great success. Cleo hit the newsstands in November 1972 and I can remember going to the news agents and just looking at it and thinking, wow. And you know, magazines have this wonderful smell about them as well. You know, they, you can smell the, the ink and the paper. It's, it's better than Chanel Number no. 5, I'll tell you. Ita Buttrose's editorial judgment has turned a quarter of a million news agency customers into regular buyers of Clio in a little over two years. Why can't we ever get them smiling? They always look as though they're going to a bloody funeral. I think they get tensed or something. Yeah. Like People remember the centrefolds, of course, but there was a whole lot of other stuff that really was quite new and quite an important conversation at that time. There were very plain spoken stories about women's health issues, etc., that I don't ever recall having seen in a magazine before that arrived. We could start the cover lines, we could start the cover lines down there. And then, would somebody answer that phone, please? Was she a tough boss? Yes. Uh, tough in as much as there was a standard. The standard was set. Uh, she wouldn't expect us to do anything that she wouldn't do. I'm always fascinated by the use of the word tough. You know, I'm, I'm a tough boss. Does it mean I can make decisions? Yep. Does it mean I won't suffer fools lightly? Yep. But being tough doesn't make you mean. It doesn't make you a less than caring person. It doesn't make you a difficult person to work for. Leadership is tough and you have to make and take tough decisions. And if you can't, you shouldn't be in leadership. The area in which I think they're probably unaware is just how much you've contributed towards women's standing in this community and how much you've managed to achieve for women. The Ita Kerry relationship was a very special one. She had a, a, an enormous influence over Kerry and essentially that arose out of their joint success with Cleo. Look, Kerry was a great person to work with. I mean, he was a lot of fun because he had a fantastic sense of humour. He had this natural curiosity, we thought alike. We could immediately grasp the big ideas that each of us had. And it's a very rare thing when this happens and it's really exciting. Thank you for being a friend and you've been a great joy to work with. All the best and enjoy your night. Look, we, we were great friends. We were best friends, really. And um, a long time ago, we made a pact that whatever happened, neither of us would ever talk about the other. Now, real friendship is based on trust. And you expect a true friend to honour that trust. And I always have. And I always will. We all know how important a health checkup is. Well, what about marriage? This week, the Australian Women's Weekly takes a long look at marriage. The most radical thing she did was with Clio magazine, but then she quickly, having made a success of that, she quickly moved right into the heart of the Australian mainstream. You could not get more mainstream than the Australian Women's Weekly. The Women's Weekly isn't thing. going to be another Clio, just no. as Clio was never meant to be another Women's Weekly. I think somewhere in the back of my mind lurked the thought that one day I'd get to the Women's Weekly. It was, it was regarded as the magazine. It was the top job. This was the magazine that I started on as a copy girl at 15. And here I was at 33, I was now the editor. I think the 70s for Ita were her golden decade. I think that people discovered Ita, not only the Packers, and at that time, I think it was that she was voted the most popular woman in Australia. I mean, every, you only had to say Ita, no one ever said Ita who. Just before Christmas 1980, I remember it, and it was breaking news that Ita Buttrose was not only leaving the Woman's Weekly, she was leaving the employee of Kerry Packer and going to work for Rupert Murdoch. Look, it was very difficult telling Kerry that I was going to leave because I'd grown up in that company. He probably saw her actions as being disloyal and he reacted as a packer would. She lost the car. 
She lost her house because that was all part of her package. He felt that she had betrayed him. Of course he was cranky. Of course he was going to go ballistic. I knew that. But he got over it. Ito joined News Limited and was appointed editor-in-chief of the Sunday and Daily Telegraphs and subsequently a member of the board. It was the first time a female had been appointed to lead a metropolitan newspaper. It was quite a shock, though, News Limited, because it was a very male company. You know, I, I laugh, but it's true. The testosterone smell almost knocks you out as you walk in the front door. News Limited had a pretty robust culture, and the men there would take no prisoners. They would have judged her not to be equipped to be taking decisions on financial and political journalism, because that wasn't her background. You know, I was hissed at as I walked through the fourth floor, the editorial open plan floor. And it's, it's, it's most unpleasant. And you have to sort of pretend you don't hear, you don't mind, but you do mind. You do mind. And it does hurt. It was in a climate that was dominated by very, very powerful, strong-willed men who were used to getting their way, who were used to being listened to. She was at the same time doing a lot of important work in unpopular and difficult issues like AIDS. As the AIDS epidemic gathers momentum, the Australian government has conscripted media personality Ita Buttrose, recently voted our most admired woman, to head a national advisory committee. I've got to point out it's a screening test which detects antibodies to the disease. I just am really interested in health. And in the early 80s, Neil Blewett, the then health minister, rang me. They were looking for a communicator that the public would trust. Good afternoon, Mary. No, you don't have to be worried about giving blood at all. Many people had advised her not to take that role. It would be bad for her image. There was a lot of stigma attached to those people who had the virus. Gay men died in large numbers. Many of my gay friends died. It was dreadful. It was an awful time. The people were terrified of getting AIDS. And then there were, do you get it from teacups and knives and forks? And then someone rang and wanted to know if you could get it from the communion cup. The World Health Organization did say that we had run a, a really good campaign, you know, that our approach to HIV, AIDS has, had been excellent, you know, that we were one of the world leaders, and, and all of us were very proud because it was a hard, it was a hard call. I stayed at News Limited for four years, which was quite a record for someone who's editor-in-chief. Rupert once said to me that um, he's got everything he wants out of an editor in 18 months. You think, well, I'll start my own business. The Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Riles and Ida and friends. Um, there's no doubt the launch day of Ida, the magazine, is another. I decided I'd create a magazine called Ita, a magazine for the woman who wasn't born yesterday. In other words, the older woman. Gasp. Older. Not a good word for women. I got a letter from a woman who says she's a discarded second wife. It was a courageous move to go and do her own thing. I must have judged a book by its cover, Dorian. I always thought it was far too high risk because she didn't have the financing that was really required to, to launch a publication like that. We did have a recession and uh, it was also difficult to get the revenue, the advertising. We had a very loyal readership but it just didn't work. I'm very disappointed. What would you think I'd be? When I'd had to close that magazine, it, it hurt. You know, it was like her third baby. Uh, and she lost it. Uh, it hurts. I'm not conscious that anybody turned their backs on her, but there aren't that many employers in this industry. And so after I closed Ida, I did, I did write off a few applications and, and I didn't even get a response and I thought, that's a bit crook. Is Ida the person a failure now? No, and, you know, I won't, I won't wear that I'm a failure. You know, if, if, you, if you take risks in your life, 
there's always going to be something that works and something that doesn't. But if you never do anything because you think it's going to fail, then what's the point of living? Ita has continued with every new decade to just completely reinvent herself. This energy that she has that is really infectious. You sort of sit there and watch it and just go, wow. No one should live in shame because they have a medical diagnosis of dementia. It is unacceptable. Ita quickly finds causes and if, it, if, if, if a health problem has risen in one of the family members, and she goes out and finds out about it. She picks it up and runs with it. Let's fight dementia. We're fighting dementia. Her father had dementia. He also had macular degeneration. So they're two causes that Ida immediately fell to because she had seen firsthand the lived experience. We were shocked and dismayed that in the last federal budget, there was no additional funding for any dementia services or research. Ida was a carer when he had dementia, so she gets it. It's not easy. It was difficult watching Dad decline as he got older. He was only 65 when he left the ABC and he, he really wasn't ready to retire, so he got a job at the Arts Council of Australia and he worked until he was 70. But he did want to stay in his own home and I don't know how we did it, but we managed to keep him there. And he was there until he died in hospital. 10 days shy of him turning 90. Unless we address this issue, the cost down the track will be horrendous. Ida did an incredible job with dementia. It was then Alzheimer's Australia. She had hooked up with the CEO, Glenn Reese. They together were a dynamic duo and they were relentless in their advocacy. If I have to raise my voice until I am hoarse, then so be it. <laughs> the government finally got it and committed a large sum of money to dementia research and dementia support. <laughs> Over the years, I just never let herself stagnate. When an opportunity comes along, it's, well, yeah, I can do that. When Ida went to work for Studio 10, that was another new experience. Well, seen the, well seen the this other side of me, that I actually do have a sense of humour and I do laugh. Yes, it's very nice. I'll take him home. <laughs> and I used to love it. I'd say something and, and Joe would say, I can't believe you said that. And I'd think, yes, got him. I like bad boys. Oh, yeah, I like cougars. <laughs> I loved it. I had a great time. But I, I left the program after five years because I think it was time to move on. Sometimes you can overstay your welcome. And there were other things I wanted to do with my life. There'd been a huge amount of turmoil at the ABC in the year leading up to Ita joining. We all know the ABC is under strong and growing political pressure. Hands off, ABC! The organisation had been through a lot of tumultuous change and we really needed someone who could come in and lead the way. There was a five-month search that an independent nomination panel did. They put four names forward to the government. Ita Butros did not apply, was not on that list. She didn't even ask to be part of the process. A couple of months pass of silence, and then out of the blue, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister at the time, makes a captain's pick. Uh, look, I'm very honoured to have been asked to chair the ABC. The first big crisis Ita faced as chairman was when the AFP raided the offices. Last week's raids are triggering repercussions far and wide, with its newly installed chairwoman delivering her complaints directly to the Prime Minister. After the AFP raids, Ita spoke really strongly about our, the importance of having an independent broadcaster. He's taken on board my comments and we're looking forward to working together and going ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. You could feel the pressure rising through 2021 over a series of perceived anti-government stories had been growing, strengthening pressure against the ABC. Tonight on Four Corners, we go inside the Canberra bubble with an investigation that questions the conduct of some of the most senior politicians in the nation. In 
inside the Canberra bubble was a piece about the culture inside Parliament House in Canberra and specifically around allegations of sexual harassment, bullying and a, a poor culture that mistreated staffers, some of it involving senior ministers, some of it not. Four Corners does not suggest only Liberal politicians cross this line, but the Liberal Party is in government. I wrote a letter to the chair, to Ida Buttros, uh, asking a number of questions of, uh, of Ita and the board about whether the program met the required standard of objectivity and impartiality. Why are the private lives of individual politicians a matter of appropriate journalistic scrutiny? Yeah, Paul Fletcher really putting the heat on the ABC board and Chair Ida Buttrose in particular. Now, if we want the ABC to change, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, needs to intervene now and he needs to sack the chairman, Ida Buttrose, he needs to sack the board and he needs to clean out the senior executive ranks. The chair and the board are actually duty-bound to defend the independence of the ABC. It's, it's part of the ABC's act. So as uncomfortable as it may have been for various members of the board, who might have preferred a world in which the issue wasn't raised uh, in the way in which it was, nonetheless, um, they defended uh, the ABC's independence as their duty bound to do. I felt the minister might have been egged on by some of his colleagues, but I might be wrong in that assumption. But I think, as it turned out, the Canberra bubble stood on its own two feet. It was an important, it was an important piece of, of, of journalism. This was a massive challenge for any chair in that situation. Then, of course, came the ghost train story. What do you think caused this fire? Arson. It was arson. Arson, yeah. The cover-up was monumental. There is somebody that got away with murder. It's time for the truth. Exposed. Former police have also alleged there was a web of connections between Saffron, former High Court Judge Lionel Murphy, and former New South Wales Premier Neville Rann. The Tiffin Masters Review, published quietly a few hours ago, has found against the programme makers in concluding that Exposed did accuse Neville Rann of corruption and complicity in covering up arson and did not have enough evidence to do so. The Tiffin Masters Review also praised Exposed in many respects. It went to air and some people thought the Neville Rann um, accusations should not have been included. My view doesn't really matter because, because it's an operational matter. So the Ghost Train Review, by and large, said that it was an excellent documentary that brought to light new information for the, from then which um, a police investigation ensued. It did suggest that we could have done a better job of clarifying what we were saying and not saying in that program. When Sydney journalist Juanita Nielsen disappeared in July 1975, she sparked off one of this country's biggest crime mysteries. Suffice to say, Juanita Nelson's story, there were flaws, clearly there were flaws, and, and the management recognised that and set to work to fix them. And it did prompt a lot of questions about the ABC. People do need to take a break, mm. even if they can't. The board aren't making editorial decisions. The board will look to me as the editor-in-chief and managing director. There's a leadership team, we're meeting this Friday. Working closely with Ita over the last three and a half years, no matter what's been going on, ITA is completely unflappable, ensuring that uh, for everything we do, all the checks and, and balances happen. Having been through what feels like a period of reform. We have a no surprises policy. If I know that something's coming, uh, I try to inform the chair of it. Uh, and having that close relationship between the managing director and chair of the ABC and ITA's experience uh, that I can bounce off of is incredibly valuable. Some of the suggestions were not, were not up to standard. I mean, I can't issue an order about something I might see on television, but that doesn't prevent me from saying, I think we could have done better, and I leave it with David to think about from my point of view. So it did seem like a good time to review our complaints handling system. We've asked for a much more detailed report. It's not good enough to keep on doing things the same old, same old. You've got to say, can we do better? We did a lot of training and we... The review into complaints handling was a board decision and Ita, as chair of the board, leads it. We'll be vigilant in, in, in making sure that we keep at it. That review showed that our complaints handling procedure was 
was pretty good actually, uh, that we were doing a good job of that, but it could be strengthened for the future and strengthened by the appointment of an ombudsman. It remains to be seen whether it's, uh, whether it's enough, but I certainly think it is a positive step. And I think that was Ita's initiative, uh, and I think that does reflect some of her deep experience in the media over many decades. <laughs> Take that hand a bit closer to your collarbone. I've been around a long time, and you know, the, the mistakes that happen today are probably mistakes that I might have made or been a part of some years beforehand. I mean, nothing much is new. They all seem so old. <laughs> Do you feel the frailty of age yourself? Do I look it? Do I look like I feel the frailty of age? I don't think so. No, I think. I think I accept there are some things I can't do or shouldn't do. If you lean towards me that little smidgen, yeah. I have slowed down, but I don't wish to retire. No, I, I like working. I can't envisage my life without working. Maybe because I've been working since I'm 15. Maybe it's just so much a part of my life that it is my life. And I, I am able to do what I want to do. If I want to go to the opera, I can go to the opera. If I want to go down and play with the grandchildren, I can do that. You know, I've got plenty of time to do things I want to do. We all hear a drum beat. My drum's still beating quite strongly. There are things I want to do. 